So today we have the first of a series of webinars on the Open Building Institute. Uh, as in the Kickstarter we recently funded successfully. Uh, the first, first lecture today is about the Living Building Challenge, which is part of the goals for our project at Open Building Institute, which is the highest certification mark for regenerative construction. And it's been created by the good people from BNIM Architects. They're a world-renowned architecture firm. And today we have Phaedra Speck, who's a, an architect. She okay. is an associate at BNIM. She is a sustainable design consult consultant, architect, and planner, um, working with Bob Berkebeel, who's one of the founders of BNIM. So I'd like to introduce Phaedra on a Living Building Challenge presentation for the Open Building Institute. So Phaedra, please, please take it away. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope that you can hear pretty well and see pretty well. We compressed the slideshow so that it will advance quickly, and hopefully it won't be too grainy for you, but we'll, we'll hope we'll pop through it. Um, there's a few notes in the chat box, if any of you can see that. Um, little housekeeping things about technology that will help the webinar be more smooth. And part of it is that if you use the, the go-to meeting, if you could call in on your personal phones, usually that makes your web um, a little bit faster. And if you do that, it will could cause interference on the line. So make sure you have your open mics closed or your phone set to mute. And we'll have a time at the end for some questions. And you can also type in questions in the chat box if you um, would like to do that. And I'll try to observe them. Uh, I'm going to turn my webcam off, cam off now because you don't need to see me, I think, as much maybe as the slides. Let's see. Ah, we're frozen. <laughs> Give me just a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome from the Open Building Institute. And I want to share a little bit of, just a little bit of history about how we've been involved in with the Living Building Challenge. So one thing you said was that we created it. And I think that's a little bit true, but also not entirely true. So years ago, um, Bob Berkebile on the left here, who had really intended to join us today, he had a little bit of minor surgery and is in recovery. And his doctor will not release him to come today. But he's, he's healing and um, resting today. So he sends his apologies for not being able to join us. Um, but Jason McLennan in the middle is uh, one of my former colleagues at BNIM. And um, I'm on the right there. And the three of us were involved years ago with many, many other folks in a project for Montana State University. It was a research project. And during the day, um, we would work hard on that project. And, and it just so happened that many of the consultants on that project 15 years ago now, were also the founding members of the US Green Building Council who were trying desperately to develop LEED, which was a new tool in those days. And over drinks and dessert, um, Bob and Jason, particularly with all these consultants, would talk about the future of the industry and how um, LEED was going to transform things, and quickly determined that LEED was not going to be enough. Even achieving LEED Platinum would only do less bad, um, just based on the, the definition of the program. And so they started talking about, well, what does that, what do we need to be doing to achieve what has to happen on the planet? And then it, luckily at that time, there were people like Amory Levins from the Rocky Mountain Institute and Janine Benyus from um, the Biomimicry Institute. And they were starting to help explore ideas of living systems and biology and how does how does a building relate to living systems. And they quickly, um, I just got Martin's face popped up there. Um, they oh, quickly I just for a second, sorry. There you go, <laughs> that's OK. Um, they, they quickly started thinking about the metaphor of a flower and how a flower 
uses only the sun that's available and only the rain that's available, and it, it communicates with its neighbors in a symbiotic relationship, and its waste materials then become food for something else. And so, um, so um, uh, they, the metaphor of a living building and a flower became the, um, the beginning thoughts about living building challenge and what would that look like. And so then Jason left BNIM and became the Cascadia uh, chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council CEO. And together, Bob and Jason launched the Living Building Challenge. And then Jason went on to launch the International Living Future Institute, which, which administers and develops it. And through three versions of that system now, uh, we have been at BNIM trying to understand what that looks like in the built environment. And so we had one of the first uh, living buildings, which is the Omega Center in Rhinebeck, New York, which is the first yoga studio that is uh, also a wastewater treatment facility. Um, and we also built a tree house for the Boy Scouts that um, complies with living building challenge. So you can see how there are many different scales to the project. Most recently, I've been involved in Kansas City understanding how to, um, as we thought, thought about moving our headquarters, we looked at an old building that in the past had been a beautiful Beaux-Arts style building on the corner of Baltimore and uh, 17th Street and had fallen in through many um, iterations and changes, had fallen into blight, which is the picture you see in the present. And then we started imagining how to take the bones of this old building and co convert it into a living building challenge. And this is something that we're working on now. And so, so this is my history now with, uh, with the living building challenge, trying to understand how in an urban scale, in the urban core, um, to apply these principles. And so that's a, that's a long story about our background in living building challenge and maybe why we're here today talking to you about this. But um, the Open Building Institute has asked us to share how does, this, how does this impact you? How does this impact the residential scale? People who want to build their own home or people who are interested in continuing to learn about the eco, the seed eco home that um, Martin and Katerita are are helping to develop and give birth to in the world. And many of you are starting to be collaborators and what that looks like and how to do it on the ground. And it's very exciting for us to watch what you are all doing because this is a really um, critical and interesting time in our history where um, Bob and I see that many things are going to change in the housing world, we predict. Um, this is a, from an article Bob wrote, an interview he gave uh, to residential architects called Regenerative Housing by 2020. And it was a, a prediction, a bold prediction at the time when he wrote this article. But as he um, continues to work through development projects here in Kansas City that are at the multifamily residential scale, he's finding that these things are actually coming true. And so we hope that you'll find those things coming true as you embark on your projects, but yeah. he, he said Sorry, that by, yes. if I may interrupt for a second, so just the last picture, that was our five-day build yes. of the season, an aquaponic greenhouse. What you see there is a team of about 60 people. We've built the structure, the main house in five days, and the greenhouse in another five. So we are actively in the process of pursuing a lot of the, the high-quality environmental aspects that we're discussing here. So it's a live okay. experiment in Mm -hmm. And it, it's very inspiring to me because so often I feel like a, as a consultant and a, working for a big architecture and planning firm, I feel like we're always trying to change the industry and change the world and, and make um, the, the whole community um, find better ways. But of course to do that means incremental baby steps. And I love watching that you, that the way that you set your vision um, towards something and then one step at a time you get there very quickly and, and with each iteration 
it gets better and better and better. And I know that's the whole idea behind your open source ecology, which is just such an exciting experiment. And I think the real promise for today's lecture is the beginning of a long relationship where we connect better to the Living Building Challenge, the, the open source ideas and approach that you have to this project. It's very, very exciting in my mind. But so some yeah. of the things that Bob predicted was that in by 2020, the year of perfect vision, homes in demand will bear little resemblance to those that um, in Bob's generation were raised in, or my, my generation for that matter. Housing will be healthier for residents, for the community, for the planet, and buyers will require site-specific, performance-based, information via web applications. And he's finding that this is already true with the advent of many of Apple's home monitoring programs and many other um, manufacturers as well. But this will inform their decisions about which homes to rent or purchase. The same technology will remote con remotely control the comfort of residents and their operations as it, of its, of its appliances and its security system and even its music and media while simultaneously negotiating with utility providers for clean power at the base best rate, that there will be amenities that are not even currently well defined that will influence consumer decisions. And um, in his work as a developer, he's, he's realizing that those are things like zip cars available to drive so that you don't have to own a car, and grocery stores that bring CSA to the building, and things like that. Sharing of rakes and shovels and um, media equipment and all kinds of common spaces um, are amenities that we don't usually think about, but now are becoming consumer choices. And he's also finding that requests for net positive energy and water will become common, and interest in proximity to work, good food, recreation, and entertainment will be the norm. And of course, as millennials and baby boomers um, start to move downtown to walkable communities where they can age in place or live a life uh, that in integrates all parts of their um, existence, we're finding that this is reshaping the communities that we live in. It's also representing a huge opportunity in the, in the economy because only about 4% of the housing market is actually responding to this demand. Very exciting. Yes. Hmm. So there are a few overview things that I want to touch on, and I'm not going to go too deeply today into any of the details about Living Building Challenge. But all of this stuff is available online to review. I'm hoping to give you a nice overview of the system and to really try to show you a few residential scale examples of, what, of issues that you might think about in, in design. So I'll start today by talking about the certification options that you have within the Living Building Challenge system. They're trying to make uh, at least with this version of Living Building Challenge, they're the version three, they're trying to make um, it a really versatile system that works at many scales, that allows you to, to jump between scales, and it allows you to uh, do all or even part of the certification as long as you're doing something. So the three levels of certification that one could go for are full certification, which means that you achieve all of, all of the pedals and the imperatives. That you, you can also go for pedal certification, which is um, three of the pedals, and one of those must be energy, water, or materials. And the first imperative, which has to do with how you select your site um, to make sure that you haven't selected a sensitive site that is like a wetland or a farmland or something like that. And then the 20th uh, imperative is the one that relates to um, the educational components and the educational program that's an integral part of your process. So the, one of the major 
uh, points behind Living Building Challenge is that when you choose to certify, you're choosing to become a part of this community that is learning together. And just like open source ecology, you're trying to sh you're committing to share what you're learning with everyone else who comes after you. So, uh, and also you benefit from what everyone has learned ahead of you. So that is part of their fundamental thinking as well. So the other kind of certification you can do is net zero energy. And that requires that you achieve everything within the energy pedal plus the first imperative and the 20th imperative. The little subtle difference is that in the energy pedal for full certification, you actually have to provide more renewable energy than your building demand by 5% to build in a little bit of resilience. Whereas net zero energy allows you to simply meet your energy demand and be truly net zero. So those are three certification options. And part of the certification process requires that you, you um, register the project, you pay some fees to register, and then you complete the design and you collect some documentation. And there's some documentation that you can collect that you can certify right away because it's just kind of preliminary and it's about the design and it's about um, what you've specified. And then there are a number of things like energy, water, urban agriculture, for example, that they actually measure a full year's worth of performance before you can receive your certification. Then there's a process with many steps in it. And the key thing that makes a Living Building Challenge stand out from other building rating systems is that a, an auditor will actually come to the site and review it and make sure that the claims you have are true. And so those are the things that distinguish it and make it very rigorous. They're also things that drive the cost of certification up just a little bit because you have to pay for that site visit. So we'll talk about that later, maybe um, more. Um, so another part of um, how the Living Building Challenge allows for some kind of flexibility of scale and building type is that they rely on the living transects, which are based on new urbanism transects. And based on whether or not you're in um, a natural preserve area, a rural or agricultural zone, which is where I assume most of your work in Maysville um, is probably in, in L2, living transect, or whether you're in a small town, a village, a, cam a campus, whether you're in general urban, and so most of Kansas City, for example, um, is general urban. And then once you get downtown, you're between general urban and urban center. And it just has to do with your floor area ratio and the density of the construction around you. And Kansas City at one time was a very dense metropolitan area. And, and over the years, our, our center core of town has become less dense. And so based on your density and the the type of mixed use development around you, you set a target and then it helps to identify what level you have to um, reach in, in many of the various points. And so there are also three typologies. There is not a specific typology for residential construction. Um, residential is just considered a building, whether it's single family or multifamily, whether it's an office building, whether it's a, an auditorium or a civic building, they're all buildings. And they're defined on, as whether or not they are complete and whole and in themselves, and they have their own mechanical systems, and they have their or, or natural um, ventilation systems. And that it's you know, usually new construction or major renovations to the building that affect its envelope, its skin, its um, systems, its plumbing. Um, there's also a typology called renovation, which is really for minor um, tenant finish kinds of interior renovations, where you may have a full building, but you're only renovating one floor. Um, so that would allow you to use the renovation typology. And it would mean that certain, certain imperatives apply or do not apply to your project. There's also a typology for infrastructure and landscape, if it's a park or a bridge or a trail project. And then there's a community typology 
which allows a whole um, neighborhood district or a development or a campus, even a small village, to be certified together as one project. And there are seven petals, 20 imperatives. I think on the previous slide um, it said five, and I apologize for that typo, but there are seven petals, 20 imperatives, and, and we're going to walk through the seven petals and try to give you examples of the various imperatives. So within the place petal, there are four imperatives, limits to growth, urban agriculture, habitat exchange, and human-powered living. Um, these, the intents of these petals are to do things like curb sprawl, um, so that we're, we're limiting urban sprawl or suburban sprawl, to restore and protect ecosystems, to uh, protect agricultural zones for agriculture, to reconnect people to their food systems, to expand existing and thriving wildernesses that um, maybe have become fragmented or disconnected. It's about looking at transportation and how it relates to environmental impacts and trying to reduce those impacts. Um, enhancing how communities are connected to each other and how people are connected to their community. And trying to enjoy a productive lifestyle, but not relying on the automobile as much as we do in many of our cities. So how does that impact the residential issues or residential scale? I'm going to give you a few examples here that relate to some of the imperatives. And if you're planning or designing your home, these might be things that you would consider. And in some of these slides, you're going to see examples like the top left of the seed home and the hydroponic, the um, hydroponic uh, greenhouse that's a part of that. Um, so you'll actually see some examples of this particular um, project and how you're already doing some great things related to Living Building Challenge. But hopefully it will also help you to think about new things that maybe you are or not haven't thought about yet. So for example, the, the very first imperative that limits how um, you select your site, they don't want you to develop on prime farmland, wetlands, on virgin prairie, within a wetland, or sorry, within a 100-year floodplain. Um, if you're on a coastal area, they don't want you in a coastal waterway. Uh, so part of it is to make sure that you're not picking a sensitive site. And that is the very first imperative. And if, if you're trying to build on the side of a mountaintop somewhere, this, this may be a challenge, right? You can't, put, you can't, it uh, doesn't matter what you do um, to protect it if it's, a, if it's the wrong site. So it's also about providing habitat as you develop your site that is appropriate for your transect. So when I showed you the picture of our office building downtown, we were developing a vacant lot next to the building um, that was that is now a surface asphalt parking and we were trying to show an urban green space that connected to several other urban green spaces um, within the downtown to try to create some connected habitat even in the middle of an urban environment. And of course if you're in a rural setting, it would be about um, using native landscapes that's not, you know, not having lawn everywhere that's irrigated and mowed every week with or maintained with chemicals. Um, and it's also about planting and choosing this, the plants that are appropriate for your region. That's a pretty typical design strategy now. Um, it's also about making sure that you maintain that landscape without fertilizers and pesticides that are petrochemical based. And it's, a, it's about setting aside a percentage of your site for an edible landscape or urban agriculture or just agri plain agriculture. Um, it, depending on your transect, that might be 1% in an urban, dense urban area, or it might be as much as 80% in a rural area that is set aside in perpetuity or for at least 15 years to be um, solely for the purpose of producing 
food and um, uh, edible landscape for animals and habitat. And in some cases, you can plant um, flowers and wildflowers that work for pollinating insects to support agriculture in the area. Um, single family residents must also, as a part of this credit, pro prove that they have storage um, for two weeks worth of food. And they, they tell you how to measure that more specifically. But part of that is how version three of Living Building Challenge has, has tried to build in resilient strategies. So they're trying to make sure that you have purified drinking water, that you have more energy than, than you need stored for backup power, and that you have food on hand in case of an emergency. And so a whole lot of Living Building Challenge is also now building resilience. Another part of this program are to have an acre to acre land trust habitat exchange program. So part of deciding to certify for Living Building Challenge means that you pay an offset to protect wild land um, in, in an equal measure to your site. And if you have a small residential site, there's a minimum of one acre that you would be contributing to, to maintain um, somewhere else in your community. Um, part of, another part of this is that you as a household would have to develop a mobility plan and show how your project is helping you to reduce your transportation footprint. So that's probably a little bit about where you're located relative to where you work and whether or not you're able to use public transit or bicycle or walk. And, and if you can't, then it's about having alternative fuel vehicles or installing a charging station, these kinds of strategies. So the next, another pedal is the water pedal. Um, it's, it's that, and the imperative is net positive water. Um, so the, this is a very messy, fun, wonderful, geeky pedal that requires often a lot of different players. In my world, in a, as a commercial architect, it means that I have to have big meetings with landscape um, designer, with landscape architects, with plumbing engineers, with civil engineers, um, often with a wastewater treatment specialist or a biological wastewater treatment consultant. And um, we create huge spreadsheets that have the entire water balance of the site in one place. But the basic concept is very simple. Rainwater falls on the site, and that you want to be able to collect and reuse and reuse that water and clean it and purify it and return it to the environment in the way that it would have um, been processed by an indigenous ecosystem that was there probably prior to European settlement, um, just to give you a point in time. So, what you do is you have to do a little history about your site and your place and its geology and its um, ecological region and its biome and try to understand the ecosystem services that would have been in place, how much water would infiltrate, how much water would evapotranspire, how much water would just plain evaporate into the, into the environment, and how much would return to a local aquifer or a water table. And and it's about trying to mimic that pattern, even if that site has been completely transformed by development. So it means now collecting that water, using it for green, in a green roof, using it, collecting it, and reusing it for flushing toilets, um, all kinds of things. And so here are some examples at the residential scale. Um, this is one of the seed homes on the bottom left here that is, um, you know, in my mind, this image shows an example of an edible native landscape that is water efficient because it's, you don't have to irrigate, mow, or um, chemically treat this lawn, and it is yes very water efficient. Yes for the wheat. Huh? Yes that, for the wheat. <laughs> yes for the wheat. <laughs> is that your winter wheat there? So, but that's no. an edible. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's, I'm, just, I'm just laughing about weeds because people tell oh, us to weed. mow them. Yes, down yes. here. <laughs> yes, for the weeds. 
Well, so but yeah, you probably do. Yeah. Yes, you you have. I'm sure you have some invasive species, and the Living Building Challenge does allow you to remove invasive species. Um, but there are certainly guidelines for what you can use to for how you can do that. Um, so part of it is that at the residential scale, you would want to collect all of your all of the rainwater that you can. And here I've shown an above ground tank. But often, in order to to um, in order to approach water, the best way is to reduce your water demand. And in many living building challenge projects, they end up using composting toilets or dry to fixtures or things like this. Um, separating toilet, which is, I think, something that the seed home uses um, to separate the water waste from the solid waste and allow it to be more um, readily processed that way. And it's, very, it's much more water efficient. So the idea is to reduce the water demand to separate the water into what's potable water and what can be non-potable water and then to purify water without the use of chemicals, um, which is often a code issue, um, to be able to, the, the ideal state is to be able to drink that water and to be able to use it for all your potable water needs. And then to find gray water needs to reuse and continue to reuse water, like maybe to use your sinks to flush your toilets or to use, um, your, your sink water to collect if you need to do any irrigation um, or, or anything like that. So the idea is to try to be as closed loop as possible. And this would suggest that you don't have any municipal connections whatsoever. And that's just fine with the Living Building Challenge if you don't have those connections. However, building codes um, require often those connections. And, and often building codes or public health departments do not allow you to drink anything but treated municipal water or rural water. And so in those situations, there are exceptions that allow you to connect if you need to connect or to if the municipality requires you to drink a different source of water, um, then that's OK. But they want you to show that you have done everything you can to advocate for a closed loop system, to show that it can be safe, to try to educate those local code officials about what's possible, and to create a design that is capable of performing that way as if at some point in the future the codes change. So it's a lot, again, about advocacy and education. This program is a lot about those. And I have found that the water aspect of this project is, for me, one of the most exciting and interesting areas of um, of study. Uh, net, uh, the energy pedal requires net positive energy. And remember, I told you the net zero energy is net zero. Net positive means that you're producing more than you need. So relying solely on renewable forms of energy to operate year round in a safe, pollution free environment. And that means that you're providing, you, you, you figure out what your, you have to model and figure out what your energy demand is. And you want to reduce that as much as you possibly can before you get started. Because then you have to provide renewable energy for whatever's left. Um, so generally, we set an energy target for our projects by looking at the building type and the climate zone that you're in and setting a project goal. Um, uh, understanding what typical benchmarks for that building type are in that region, and then we set the, pro the bar 70% you know, lower than that, or, or as much as we possibly can. And while we're designing, we, we do what Amory Levins from the Rocky Mountain Institute used to do, and we put post-it notes on our forehead that say, every watt counts. And we keep hammering away until we have the, the demand for energy as low as it possibly can be by using as many passive strategies as possible. And then once we have a small energy problem, we solve it with the most appropriate renewable technology. And the Living Building Challenge is very particular about which renewable energies they allow. Um, they don't want any bio-based fuels. They don't want any 
um, on-site combustion. They don't want generators to be fuel-oriented. Um, so the one exception to the combustion on site that is allowed is in a kind of rural trans transect for residential projects where it's culturally a part of um, a tradition to have a fireplace. Um, they allow a, a picturesque fireplace or a, a decorative fireplace is, is allowed. Um, for occasional cultural uses, but it, you have to show that the house can be completely heated and cooled without it. Um, so that it's, you know, and also part of the reason they allow that in the rural transect is that usually the fuel supply is readily available and the lack of density allows the environment to absorb that small amount of pollution. So they do allow that exception. Um, but by and large, the idea is to, to um, monitor and measure and operate efficiently and to use your renewable energy to supply 105% of what your annual energy demand is. And of course, during the certification process, you have to prove that with actual performance, not just modeled performance. Um, so you also have to have backup power. That's part of the resilience strategy that is, allows you to, to do 10% of your lighting load and seven days worth of refrigeration without a combustible generator. And so here I'm showing you the Tesla power packs, the battery, the battery backup that often goes along with photovoltaics in order to um, store excess power. And part of the reason for net positive is that if it, it makes your whole community more resilient. If you're providing more power than you need, in an emergency, if you are tied to the grid, you can give back power to support emergency services um, for your community. So that's, again, you can live without a connection to a power grid in Living Building Challenge, and that's acceptable. But of course, you can also connect um, and just never need to use it. That's the idea. Um, Part of it is that you have to have some kind of real-time mon energy monitors and submeters. And in a, at a residential scale, um, what we're finding is that some of the thermostats that allow you to do remote control and to observe how all the different parts of your system are um, using energy uh, at the residential scale, they don't require you to have a fancy monitoring system. But they do want you to be able to understand how the different equipment in your house is performing. And so it's a combination of real-time tracking as well as using the kind of plug-in technologies that allow you to, for example, plug your refrigerator in to a, a monitor that will help you understand how much power each component is using. Um, and through that analysis, you're able to show um, that you are operating as you should. Uh, in terms of health and happiness, this is another pedal that um, has the intention of improving the health of occupants and in, in a couple of different aspects of health. One is to have a direct connection to the outdoor environment for your kind of mental and spiritual health, as well as an actual healthy interior environment that doesn't have a lot of um, toxins from our building materials. It's intended, this pedal is intended to help building occupants to um, fall in love with their place and remind themselves of their uh, love of living systems that's sort of inherent to most human beings. And it's also supposed to help bridge that divide that we, we typically have created between a natural, the natural systems and the built systems, and really help people understand that they are animals connected, connected um, to greater e ecological systems um, and biomes. So some of the things that that practically means in a, in a residential project are simple things like making sure you have great, you're taking advantage of great views to your site, to your outdoor. And it doesn't have to be a manicured 
um, lawn or anything. It can just be as wild as wild can be, but that the fact that you're not closed off from it, that you're taking advantage of views. Um, it means that you have operable windows so that you can be connected by sound, by smell, having fresh air. Uh, it, it, it does talk about a minimum amount of glazing in each facade to make sure that you're always able to look out a window in every orientation. It, it talks about user control and how um, you can open a door or adjust a thermostat to be able to, to improve your comfort. Um, it, it also requires air quality testing, and at, and at the commercial scale, that's a, usually an expense, you know, an, a, an expense that we incur at the end of the project when construction is finished. We come in and have a flesh out period, and then we have the big, the big air quality monitors come in, and some, some systems have built-in CO2 monitors and different kinds of sensors that allow you to do this at the commercial scale. And I noticed that the Living Building Challenge doesn't specifically describe how a residential um, applicant is supposed to m measure their air quality, but they also don't exempt them from the project process. So I would assume that some air quality testing after construction and before occupancy is required. And I'm not exactly sure the best way to do that. It would be one of the things you would learn as you go. I bet they don't know how you do it at the residential scale. Um, another part of it is that um, for commercial buildings, they require a vestibule and an entryway and a walk-off mat that is in the direction of travel for eight feet um, for every major and secondary entrance where people are coming and going, bring, bringing oil and pollutants on their shoes into a space. For a residential application, they Rec they still want you to have a covered entryway for your primary entrance. They still recommend that you have a walk-off mat in the direction of travel that's at least eight foot from inside to outside. But because they, that's not always appropriate for the residential scale, they say you can also demonstrate that if you have a shoes-off policy when you come in the house and a way of managing that, that you're able to meet to satisfy that requirement. So um, it's a little different for residential. And similarly, for commercial buildings, you have to show that you're doing a, that you're using a green cleaning custodial program. And it, in a home, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have a strategy for green cleaning um, to make sure that you're not introducing chemicals from your cleaning products. Another aspect of this health and happiness pedal that is also really fascinating and interesting is the, the biophilic design session that is required, as well as the, the implementing of biophilic design principles throughout the project. So biophilia means love of life. Um, philia uh, is the love part. <laughs> and so if if you are, if the whole purpose of this pedal is to try to connect people to living things and remind them of their living connections, um, the Living Building Challenge requires that you set aside a pretty substantial portion of time, a, a full eight-hour day, um, with all of your design team members, if you have a design team as a residential architect, where you do nothing but focus on the many principles of biophilic design, and there are probably 27 of them, that um, are different ways that you can connect texture, pattern, site, color, um, variation, all kinds of elements into your design, and to do it deliberately and intentionally to, to um, connect people to living things. And so this is something that's really fun. And then you have to demonstrate how you have implemented it through art or design elements or um, progress through the site or however you, however you choose. It's very open-ended what you choose. But you have to be able to demonstrate that you've done that and incorporated it all throughout design. Um, the materials pedal is the most complicated and probably requires 
a whole session in and of itself, and it's probably something that many of you are really interested in. I'm going to just gloss over it because um, I want to help you understand what's out there, but also just tell you that the strategy for except for appropriately dealing with materials on a living building project, are to allow yourself lots and lots of time for research and <laughs> lots and lots of time for outreach um, to various manufacturers. There's really no other way around it. Um, in order to meet the materials pedal, you have to um, sh prove that every single material in your project has no red list chemical on it. And there's a list of red, red list chemicals in the binder that goes on for a complete page with three columns of chemical names. So it's a very um, onerous job. And in order, to, um, in order to do that research, because the industry is really just not ready to provide it yet, it really does require time. And luckily, this is where you get to take advantage of the materials list that previous projects share, and they've done some research for you. So that's helpful. Um, so th this is about eliminating the worst chemicals with the greatest impact on human health. It's about minimizing embodied carbon through design and offset um, of offsetting construction impacts. It's about promoting industries that are responsible and social to the social and environmental system. It's about investing in local economies that strengthen a community, and of course, reducing waste and maintaining the value of materials through beneficial reuse. So I'll just go through a couple of things. So materials can't re contain red list chemicals, um, and they must document the ingredient list. Um, that's often very difficult to get from manufacturers that claim their proprietary mix is, um, is private and they don't want to share it. You have to calculate embodied energy, uh, embodied carbon based on your construction process, which is kind of a one-time um, embodied carbon calculation. And there are tools like this um, e-tool that are available that are free and probably appropriate for the residential scale. But basically, you show what your carbon footprint is, and then you make a one-time donation um, to offset that carbon footprint. Um, in terms of responsible um, uh, material suppliers, any wood that you use in a product has to be either reclaimed or certified wood, and it has to be certified with the forest Stewardship Council, which is the FSC label. There are several other um, certified wood pro, um, systems out there, and the only one that is recognized as being truly um, certified by Living Building Challenge is FSC. And then there's the DECLARE label, which is the Living Building Challenge's way of helping manufacturers to declare like an ingredient label for their product to disclose all of the ingredients, to say whether or not they are complying with the Living Building Challenge um, requirements, or if they are actually submitted for certification for third-party review through the DECLARE system. Um, there are other programs like the HPD Collaborative that are trying to do similar things, and they will that documentation will be accepted as long as it comes with a list of ingredients. So there's a lot of paperwork here. And of course, you will fail to be able to do this for all of your materials. And the Living Building Challenge simply requires that you give it a good college try, that you try for every particular material to reach out to at least three manufacturers. And when you, when you fail to find something that qualifies, that you send out um, requests for manufacturers to um, participate in the program of DECLARE and to help advocate for this in the marketplace. So again, it's about education and outreach and um, demanding better things. Um, there's also a materials radius that's within um, the requirements that helps you to understand what can come from where. And there are different categories. Certain heavy and, and dense materials have to come from close. And then as you get towards materials that are 
more important for performance like windows and things, you can go farther away. Um, and then consultants can come from as far as 500 or 5,000 kilometers away. But the idea is to try to keep the, the heavy transport materials close to home. Um, in the upper right hand column is um, a couple here in Kansas City that have a, a salvage business um, and they, so salvaged materials are important. Your, a residential project would have to include at least one salvaged material um, or, and of course many more. You can, the, the bricks that are on the bottom left here that you're making um, on site would definitely help qualify for these kinds of credits. Um, and then of course construction waste management is they call it, it they call it net positive waste and it, it is very very stringent so if you're tearing something down you have to find a beneficial reuse for as much of it as possible and if you have leftover construction materials you have to be able to recycle them and really there are different rates for different materials but generally you're in the 90 to 95 percent um, diversion from a landfill rate and that's it's challenging to achieve that. Sometimes it means you actually end up advocating for um, waste streams that don't exist, um, recycling streams that don't exist. Okay, the equity pedal um, is about creating human scaled places that promote the kinds of interactions that, that promote community, creating places that are accessible to all people, allowing the public to have access to fresh air, sunlight, and waterways, and not blocking any of that with your project, ensuring that all for-profit projects contribute to the public good, and that you promote social equity within your organization or your family, in this case. So, for example, again, you would look at your transect, and on the upper left-hand corner is just a diagram that shows how the different transects um, get more dense or less dense as you go from one to the other. And it, it's not real clear um, what will happen at the residential scale, but um, it's about being sensitive to the public domain, to what, it, what happens at the street. Are you encouraging pedestrian use? Are you creating amenities for your neighbors and your community? Are you providing furniture or quiet moments or um, a landscape that can be shared. Um, it's not about letting people into your private property or your home, I, which is required for public plazas and things in the community. Um, but just last night I was at a, a public um, city council meeting where uh, one gentleman was concerned about um, was trying to get a variance for horses on his property. And his neighbor came and complained that the horse was defecating in his front yard and that he couldn't um, open his windows because of the smell of horse urine. So it's things like that, being, being sensitive to the sounds that are created by your project and the smells that are created by your project and ensuring that you're not uh, limiting someone else's solar access or someone else's access to fresh air or to the natural amenities around them. If you are a for-profit company, then you're required to make a donation to a socially equitable um, fund for um, every thousand dollars of project cost, you donate five dollars, just to give you an idea of the scale. And then there's also a just label that allows you to, um, if you're an, orga an organization that employs people, to show that you're employing people equitably. And if you have consultants on your team, then one of them might need to have this just label. Or you might, again, be able to advocate that to share the education of this program about social equity and um, uh, safety, worker safety, and how you hand or handle um, uh, benefits and things like that. And the last pedal is beauty, um, where you, you show that you create design features intended solely for human delight, to celebrate the culture and the spirit of the place, and to have meaningful integrated art into the public space. So it also practically means 
that you are providing education with your project, that maybe you're hosting an annual open house, that you have some sort of an educational website, a brochure, and some kind of interpretive signage. And it's not very clear what that looks like at the residential scale. But in terms of the Open Building Institute, up on the upper right-hand corner, I think you guys have this well covered. Um, to show how you're, you're sharing everything you learn with the, with the rest of the world. Again, it's that open source ecology mindset. It also means that you have operation and maintenance manuals and schedules that help to train the people who will maintain your systems, or you, as you maintain your system to help you learn and grow. And, it, and again, being a part of the Living Building Challenge means that you're agreeing to share. And so generally, you create a case study for your project that is widely celebrated throughout the International Living Teacher Institute's publications and, and conferences. And you're committing to share your operational data um, to help other people learn from your project. Um, so we're nearly out of time. And I want to make sure that we have enough time to answer some questions. So I'm going to skip the last part of the presentation, which was merely just talking about how there's another way to break it down, which is that there are site selection issues. There are many issues that come up when you're in the integrated design process that you um, have to think about certain things when you're in the construction process, that there are many things related to this process that could add cost and become opportunities for innovation. Uh, that as an owner and an operator of your home over time, there are many things that you have to consider when you're embarking on this project. And that throughout the life of your project, the goal is to continue to document and measurement your, measure your actual performance. Um, so with that, I am going to leave it on this slide and check out what kind of questions anyone has posted. Yeah. Or if you, if you would like to ask a question, unmute yourself, and we'll see if we can take questions. Hello, my name is Donald Clark. Hi, Donald. Um, I, was, I was trying to think of, um, I don't believe you mentioned what would be an approximate cost to be certified to get a property certified uh, for an individual, for a, a corporation like a um, company that builds residential buildings, um, or for um, if there's a price difference for the for those, and then also the cost um, for a nonprofit that like a charity that builds homes. Yeah. Like a, an example would be Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. Um, no, I did not mention it. You're right. And, and already you have stumped the instructor. <laughs> because, uh, I have not memorized their fee structure. Um, it, it changed recently. And um, it, is, it is dependent on square footage and I don't believe it. I don't believe it matters whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit business. I think the fee is the same, and it's based on the size of your project. And um, my suggestion is would that, that be, you would that be something to consider for the future to have a different fee for corporations and non-profits. I'm sure, and I, that's really up to the International Living Future Institute, which administers the certification process. So my suggestion is that you poke around a little bit on the um, website, which is IL uh, International Living uh, ILFI.org, and find out what it costs to certify a project. And I will try to share back with. Um, when we, when we share this video, I will try to answer that question better about the cost structure. Um, and I'm sorry, I just don't have, I just don't know that information <laughs> off the okay, top of my head. You. Good question, though. I should have looked it up. <laughs> I can tell you, too, that related to 
living to the lead rating system, for example, or lead for homes, which is another program that's available for for homeowners and or home developers. Um, the price for Living Building Challenge to certify is higher, and it has to do with that um, with that auditor that comes to the site. Which my memory is that that cost is something like ten thousand um, dollars. That that's what it was for our commercial project downtown, and I don't remember if that was adjusted based on square footage or not. I'm sure it must have been. It's all based on different sizes. So I think uh, my guess is that you should just look at the website and try to understand the fee structure that way. So I don't give yeah. you the wrong number. It is, okay. The cost of certification is expensive in my mind. Mm, yeah. At the, at the residential scale. Yeah. Question from Mike Meyer. Are there any LB certified buildings in Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, places with minimal rainfall? And so so how do they meet the net positive water imperative? Um, Southern California, Arizona, Nevada. Um, gosh. If there are buildings certified in, uh, I know there are I know there are many on the West Coast, and I, or, I'm trying to think about Arizona and Nevada. Luckily, right now, we're at a point in history where the number of buildings that have been certified in Living Building Challenge are, could easily fit on a spreadsheet, right? <laughs> Not a long, long list. And um, I don't have them all memorized where they are, but if they are, if there are, they would have been certified under previous versions, which also had a net positive water, and they would all have to look at their particular climate zones and understand how much rainfall do they get. So in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada, that's not much. And you would be looking at an intensely uh, xeriscape kind of landscape. You would be looking at very water intensive or dry fixtures, and you would be trying to collect and store as much water as you could to get you through the dry season. And one of the things that um, that I do when I'm looking at a project is I've been studying the weather files more carefully than I used to because for, in Kansas City, it's the opposite problem than in the desert. But in Kansas City, if you look at our rainfall data, for the past 50 to 150 years, Kansas City got 35 inches of rain every year. But in the past 10 years, if you, or 20 years, if you look at most recent data, um, even as much as the last 50 years, you'll see the trend gradually increasing and now we get 39 inches of rain every year. And then you start looking at some of the climate projections and you realize that it could, by the end of the century, be as much as 46 inches of rain per year. So now when I'm designing my water balance, I have three separate spreadsheets with each of those rainfall numbers. I look at the worst possible drought in 1950. I look at the typical condition, which is that 39 inches of rain that we get now. And then I look at the future projected scenario, and I try to design for the worst case scenario. Because if you have a closed loop collection system, you don't want to run out of water. And most likely, those Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada projects have a re greatly reduced water demand, first of all. And then they probably have fairly large tanks that allow them to um, have enough water to get through the rough patches. Does that help? Sounds sounds like it. Let's let's move on to the next question. That is from Richard George. How many properties have been certified to date? We have a ROI and cost benchmarks versus lead or standard construction. Hmm. Oh, another good question. You guys are um, stumping me with. So I should have looked this up right before I came. Um, I don't know if, actually, I don't know if they post it. Like the U.S. Green Belt Building Council post used to post all the certified projects. Living Building Challenge doesn't do that, and so you kind of have to, 
you just kind of have to pay attention over the years to see how many they have or look at their newsletter or call them and ask them. But um, I remember talking to the Living Building Challenge uh, guy who was kind of our certification representative and, and I said, so how many, how many applications are you looking at right now? How many do you have on your desk? And he said, oh, so many. You can't believe how many it's growing. We have like 19. <laughs> and I thought compared to some of the other green, re re green building rating systems, that doesn't sound like very many. But I would say, if I had to guess, that the number of certified projects is probably something like 25 to 50 in that range. And if... Um, so if a project is registered, it theoretically has um, all of its performance data available, which is not true for LEED projects at all, unless they're doing LEED for existing buildings, operations, and maintenance. Um, LEED does not require you to submit actual construction data and, or actual operations data. So to do an actual ROI or cost-benefit cost analysis that compares the two uh, you know, the two groups of projects. It would, it's impossible because there, it's apples to orange, apples to oranges. You have actual data versus predicted data. So, the the other thing is that most projects that meet a living building challenge are immediately eligible for LEED Platinum, and so some receive dual certification and. Um, it might be better on some of those projects like the Bullet Center in Seattle um, or the Birchie School uh, in California, I think it's in California, to, to sort of look at those projects and, and understand how they're meeting their cost-benefit targets. Um, years and years ago, about 15 years, well, 12 or 15 years ago, BNIM did a report that I'd be happy to share. It might even be on our website in our, um, on our bookshelf. But it was a study for the David and Lucille Packard Foundation where um, they were building, planning to build a headquarters in Los Altos, California. And they had us model the building at what 15 years ago would have been a, cert a market rate construction process. Um, and, and we did an energy model for that, and, a, and we wrote a spec that, that described that. And then we, we did it for each level of lead where we stepped up incrementally in its performance. And then we did a study for a living building project that was re reaching net zero at the time was the definition of living building. And, and we showed what happened in terms of construction schedule, what happened in terms of uh, research and design analysis time, what happened in terms of the external cost to society due to the pollution that was generated, what happened to the first cost, and then what happened to the net present value of each of those at a 30, 60, and 100 year lifespan, including replacement costs. And that study was peer reviewed at the time and revised a year later because the construction industry, industry was changing so quickly at that time to respond to, to green construction. And if we read it again now, today we expect that it would be phenomenally true that the only thing that made sense from a total cost of ownership perspective was to go for a living building or to the highest level of sustainability that you could possibly achieve with your first cost dollar because it's the only thing that pays um, if you're going to own and operate your building for a long time. So as a homeowner, unless you're planning to flip your house and be out of it in two years and pass that value on to your future, to your future homeowners, it's the only thing that makes sense. And we've, we've operated with that um, knowledge for 15 years now in, in our industry, and it's proven to be true in every single study that's done. Um, there was Another study by Greg Katz called The Cost of Green, I think. Uh, so Greg Katz from, um, I can't remember, but 
a capital E, I think, was the name of his company. And it, it's another great study about the cost of green. Um, what else is out there? There's a lot. If you just plunk around a little bit, you'll find that it almost always pays off. Does that help, Richard? I've put in a doc to that document there that you just mentioned. Yeah. Okay. So let's see, the cost is definitely, so questions coming up about cost expenses, yeah, that's definitely true. The only thing I can say for, say for yeah. OSE's case, I mean, one way to do it for us would be to crowdfund it or use the proceeds from the workshops to pay for that, mm -hmm. or just document, plain document, say, okay, here's the certification requirements from the Living Building Challenge, here's how we're doing. And um, then not even formally get the certification if we can't afford it, but yeah. hopefully we would invest in that because the investment from the publicity or the um, the publicity pr pr probably the indirect publicity value of that is probably going to be significant. Which if we're deploying these buildings as we are trying to as real offerings to people, mm -hmm. that would drive business. Uh, in a positive direction, so there would be indirect benefits, definitely. Yeah. So there are there are a couple of ideas. I, I've been thinking about this issue a lot. I think I'm glad you asked this question, Donald, because I think I think this is really essential to this conversation. Like how I don't think we know how the cost effective version of LBC, what it looks like for this particular model, because simply no one has ever tried it before. But I suspect if you connected with the ILFI, and I would be happy to try to help facilitate that connection between between open source ecology and and the Open Building Institute and the International Living Future Institute to try to find out a strategy, just like you mentioned, Marchin, of maybe you certify one time and they allow you to um, post that as a part of your um, specs, right? And maybe there's a a discount that's applied because you're, of what your organization is trying to do, and if you contribute something to the ongoing um, the ongoing effort they have to try to solve an affordable housing um, or become a pilot case study or something, that maybe there's there's some way to develop a relationship that makes it more affordable. Um, and I can't, of course, I can't promise that because I have nothing to do with the organization, but. I think it would be so worth a conversation to try to solve that problem. And I think you're right that part of it is simply documenting it and being transparent about what you're doing. And if you publish that information, then essentially you're doing, you're providing any homeowner with the information that ILFI would want you to provide them with to be able to certify the project, to be able to guarantee their work. And all you would be lacking at that point is the third party validation. Um, so there's a lot of merit to that. And then of course you can use it as a guideline to just guide what you're doing. But I always feel like it's in, like third party certification is important um, to hold everyone in the construction process to a standard of quality. because. So often it's easy to just say, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to do that, and then it never happens. So the certification, the documentation is the really important part because it holds everyone accountable. Um, but is the third party certification and all the fees of value to a small project, um, that's something I think you just really have to look at the cost and, and evaluate. And I think, I think a conversation with them, like it, you shouldn't just turn away and say, no, I'm not going to look at this. It's too expensive. I think it's worth a conversation to find out what's possible. Um, yeah. Because it's, now, it, does that make sense? No, absolutely. And the thing is, given that we're after a replicable model, mm -hmm. it only takes an organization like OBI to say, OK, we've got a stable model. It's got these properties. And it's actually certified. We actually went through, say we go through the effort of certifying. Right. then because the plans are absolutely open source, then anyone else who does that can be on a solid footing for 
having that certification. Maybe they don't uh, yeah. get certified themselves, but they know right. that what they are building is to the standard. Right, and maybe you create a guidebook that goes along with your plans that describes how you deal with things like site selection and site development that are very site specific and not universally certifiable, right? Um, right. Or if you make a materials variation, you've described the, the criteria that you have to make meet or, you know, something like that. And it seems that there's another resource out there I wanted to share, and I haven't had a chance to pour through the whole thing yet, but I just found it the other day, that International Living Future um, Institute has a program to tackle affordable housing. And they're really, they have a white paper out right now that describes their efforts. And I think it would be worth taking a look at that to understand is there an opportunity to contribute to that effort? Because I think what you're trying to solve at Open Building Institute is far is a is an eco home, yes, but it's also a different kind of economic structure for homeowners because the single family house is no longer a sustainable model for most Americans. So, um, and it's a very creative, innovative solution that still provides beauty and good healthy food and um, a connection to community as a part of your process. And so I think I think that putting you together with them would be just a, such an interesting conversation um, to yeah. try to follow. No, we definitely would like to follow up on that. Yeah. So Please. another question on a, on a different topic. Um, regarding things like carbon trading, is there, Phaedra, could you see a model where for example, for using CBs, which have one eighth of the embodied energy of uh, fired block, as an example, and it's a local material. I put the link in uh, text just for the basic calculations. Um, can we do? How would we tap, or is it possible for us to tap some kind of a carbon exchange model where people would actually invest in us or pay us to offset their carbon because we are offsetting it for them somehow? Or any thoughts on that? Huh. Um. There, there's one little fine print thing in the energy section that describes that you cannot sell renewable energy credits to other projects because the idea is that it's about it's not about creating a renewable energy economy uh, you know credit economy it's about creating renewable energy right and so. Right. Um, I think there's a line item in there that says you cannot do that. I've, I've never thought about that for materials, though. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know there isn't something spelled out about that, but it, um, there's so much room for innovation within Living Building Challenge that it's, it's one of those things where, again, if we connect with them, we should ask them that question. And it's possible, too, that they could help you they are constantly looking for material solutions that meet their criteria. And I think as you continue to develop machines and materials that are part of your system or a wall assembly that is a part of your kit, you can, you can go through the declare process and show that your product is compliant. And it's possible that you would end up building a market for that material or that or your open source process, um, I don't I don't know what that looks like, but maybe there's mm. a way that you could capture by I know you're not charging for the idea, um, and you're mm -hmm. trying to have a do-it-yourself culture, but maybe there's some way to um, benefit the ongoing research that you're trying to do by sharing that idea with. The, pro the other projects out there that might be interested in using that product to solve their challenges. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, worth thinking about that. It's, it's probably more valuable to them to understand how you're innovating in material production than for for them to see that to do a carbon offset. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's also possible that you could become. Um, you, you know when you have to do that construction offset, 
uh, you, you measure your embodied energy for construction using like the e-tool that I showed and you make a one-time offset to a car, um, to a carbon offset program that they approve and so maybe it's possible that you could become one of those organizations. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Does that mean that it, people... I don't know what it takes to become one of those organizations, but uh, they're, usually, they're usually measured by a third party like Green E source or something like that that certifies that you're meeting all the requirements of the program, you know? Yeah. Can you discuss briefly how that how that actually works? So there's actually organizations that get paid for by the so-called polluting offenders to to yeah. uh, do something clean. Um. Well, yeah. I mean, I know a little bit about how it works. I'm not an expert, but you you make a calculation that shows what your construction footprint is, your carbon footprint for due, due to your building type and your construction, and it's usually pretty generic. And then they have, they list on their, in the reference guide and in, on their website, um, the organizations that the ILFI trusts to um, curate the carbon offset credits for that particular credit or for that particular imperative. And so, and I'm, and I'm actually getting confused now between LBC and, and LEED, but LEED, for example, um, if you want to buy a renewable energy credit as a part of the energy suite, you have to go to the Green E source um, website and on there are a number of maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 different organizations that have been vetted to actually be providing the renewable energy in the, in the way that LEED and USGBC and Green eSource approve of. And if you buy a, a credit, a renewable energy credit that comes with a Green E certification on the certificate, then it qualifies you for that credit. And I'm not exactly sure how that works with LBC, but it's similar. It's not Green E Source. It's a different. It's a different organization, and I'm trying to remember it. I I think it's maybe Climate Trust. Uh, mm -hmm. is another one. I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. Yeah. I still yeah. have not committed every word in the manual to memory. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. I hope you have all enjoyed learning something today and that it met some of your hunger to learn more. Um, I hope that we've answered, have we answered all the questions that came in? Yeah, I think for the sake of time maybe we, we can do it. Maybe yeah. some people can email further further yeah. questions on the webinar. You can use yeah. things, info at opensourceecology.org. You can use, yeah, but thank you. This definitely sparks uh, further discussion on connecting with the with the Living Building Challenge people, ILFI, starting some discussion there on how we can collaborate in a better way, especially with certification that people can, can reuse uh, based on our work, just us setting up some blueprints that other people can benefit from. But yeah, yeah, uh, Phaedra, so, so I think we can wrap up here then. So thank you very much for your time. This was quite mm -hmm. informative. And uh, we look forward to collaboration and see how BNIM and ourselves, we can work together more in the future. Yes, me too.